This is Edith Cowan University. Otherwise known as ECU. It's the home of tomorrow's presenters, reporters, broadcasters and producers. And that's us. We are the third year ECU broadcasting students. We've been given a mission to find Perth's hidden gems. The things our great city has to offer that you may not have known about. But you're about to find out. This is Secret Perth. I'm here in Warpole, a town southwest of Western Australia, about to join local storyteller Gary Muir on his Wow Wilderness Eco Cruises into the heart of the Warpole and Nornalup Inlet Marine Park. Gary's cruise, located five hours south of Perth, takes you on a two and a half hour journey from the town's jetty into Warpole's untouched natural beauty. One of the things that Walpole's always known about is being the belly button of the world. You know, there's the North Pole, there's the South Pole, but who's in the middle? Walpole! Gary's not your regular tour guide, as he is the epitome of energy. He talks about Walpole like there is nowhere in the world you'd rather be. Where Walpole is placed, it's in the, the wettest part of Western Australia. It's the least area of climate variation. It doesn't get hot, it doesn't get cold, but it's also one of the oldest national parks. The cruise has been running this route for 107 years, but there is nothing old about the experience. With his quirky stories and enthusiastic nature, Gary has you in the palm of his hands for the whole journey. The cruise takes you through some of the most charming locations the marine park has to offer. One of the things that makes Walpole unique in its waterways, there's three rivers. There's the Walpole River, there's the Franklin River, there's the Deep River. They all converge together and have a secret access out to the Southern Ocean. As we dock for morning tea, Gary transports us to a time 7,000 years ago when the Indigenous Australians walked through what was once all trees. If you came here 18,000 years ago, you still had 41 kilometres to get to the beach. That's how much the sea rose. He speaks about nature and animals like they have been friends for years. It's as if Gary has nature's switch and the sea life responds to his storytelling. Even the dolphins and friendly pelican turn up to put on a show for us. His, his name's BB. He's got a little bend in the top of his beak. In the 43 pelicans, this is his favourite spot. I love Gary and his tour, so it's, it's absolutely great what what's doing. He's, he's a great ambassador for Warpole. Just 25 kilometres northwest of Walpole, you can find the Broke Inlet. But this hidden gem holds a dark rumour. The locals here speak of a myth. They believe a murderer was in their midst. The rumour is that this is the last known location of Evan Clark. Back in Kalgoorlie in 1926, Clark, a known gold thief, helped to dismember the bodies of two on-duty police officers. Two of his gangmates had shot and killed Inspector John Walsh and Detective Sergeant Alexander Pittman. During the trial, Clark testified against his friends and was let off all charges before he was rumoured to have fled to the Broke Inlet under a new identity. Well, I don't know that it's a myth, I think it's a true story. And I was told he was given the land and in return for turning King's evidence in a murder trial of two men because he, he was pretty unpopular to have turned evidence. And so uh, to save him, they gave him a new identity and a block of land. I think it was 10 acres of land in the middle, surrounded by National Park on the shores of Broke Inlet. I enlisted historian Lisa Summers to help me solve the myth we found that Evan Clark had in fact stayed in Kalgoorlie for a year after the trial, attempting to collect a £1,000 reward for providing information which saw his two accomplices hang. A man with the last name Clark had lived at the property, but was not the original recipient of the Crown land. I think we can say pretty safely that our Evan Clark and his wife, Flory Jean, packed up their bags after a year or so in Kalgoorlie and went to England. While we uncovered that this rumour bears no truth, the legend still makes a great story. It would appear that the sun has set on this mystery. It's no secret that WA is a pet-loving state. With beautiful dog beaches like this one, it's hard not to be. 
But what you might not know is just how far the pet industry has gone to keep your four-legged friends happy. From beaches to rivers, dogs in Perth live the life. Over the past year, the pet industry has evolved rapidly. The Mr Whippy for Dogs is a treat truck which travels to them and delivers nutritious treats from the owner himself, a 93 kilo St Bernard. Um, I've had the business six years and the treat truck launched last October. We go all over Perth, all as healthy as possible for the dogs made with human grade ingredients. If your dog isn't into takeout and prefers to sit at the table, there are now even cafes designed especially for dogs. There are dog cafes around in Perth, but at the scale of 5,000 square metre, I think it is the first of its kind. We realise that there is a need for a, a space where family can gather and create beautiful memories. But it's not just dogs having all the fun. Late last year, a cat cafe opened in Subiaco. A bunch of ideas sort of clicked together. A, we can help our cats. B, we can run a social enterprise rather than waiting for donations. We just run a business and use the profits for good. Uh, and C, we don't have to be stuck in an office all day you know, in architecture. We run like a normal cafe, but instead of using the profit that we make from that business for ourselves, we give it back to Cat Haven. For those who can't bear to leave your little lads behind while working, doggy daycares have started springing up all over Perth to keep tails wagging nine to five. We play rope, we play bears, we play teddies, we play outside. We have a lot of outdoor entertainment for the dogs. I don't know how, but I just end up with people's dogs. So there you have it. We've done the digging for you, and now all you have to do is go catch. You don't have to be big to be great. The people of Perth know that size doesn't always matter. Come with me. We're going to go explore some of Perth's little nooks and crannies. Nestled in the heart of Perth's cultural centre, you'll find our first stop pretzel, housed in the little pink shipping container. The design is my favourite part by far. So, you know, when it was like, what, how can we house it? I was like, shipping container for sure. But it's like a good way to get something in a place that typically can't have something. So my favourite thing about Perth is they're able to nurture smaller, younger, little ideas. But I think eventually when all of our little ideas come together, it's going to be a fantastic place. Give us a little while and we will be a ten times better version of Melbourne with better weather. A one minute walk up the laneway from Pretzel is the Mechanics Institute small bar, where you can stop off and have a quick drink amongst the rooftops of Northbridge. So the uh, different governments around the world started up Mechanics Institutes, which were public libraries where the working class could go educate themselves, and one of the main driving points behind it was to stop them from drinking so much. So it's a bit of an ironic name considering we're a bar that serves booze. Perth bars are recognised like nationally and internationally now. I mean, what you can find in Sydney and Melbourne, you can find right here in Perth as well. What a great hidden gem. Now we're off to our last stop, the Jazz Cellar. The only way to enter this jazz club is through the old phone booth. <laughs> Come on, let's go inside. The Corner House Jazz Band started playing together in 1980 down in Fremantle. The group decided that they needed their own place. So 24 years ago, owner Roy Burton, the one seen on the left here, decided to open up the jazz cellar in Mount Hawthorne to keep Perth's jazz scene alive. You can find the band here every Friday night, but get your tickets in advance, for this jazz club is in high demand, being one of the few where people can come and celebrate jazz in Perth. Eye-catching, soulful and rich in tradition. These are the works of Peter Farmer. You can find them all over the metropolitan area, from the new Fiona Stanley Hospital to Mandra and the Swan Valley. Peter Farmer is one of WA's most successful Indigenous artists. He's had sculptures commissioned by the National Museum of Australia and even designed a jersey for the West Coast Eagles. Yeah, I do a lot of um, Noongar paintings. I do more of a the contemporary style of painting. Now, Peter's moving from art you can see to art you can wear, working with one of the world's biggest shoe designers, Professor Jimmy Chu. I thought, well, it's a big opportunity and to meet him and to, to work with him and to see my artworks that he's working with, it's a, 
Pride is a big honor. The history is very unique, very creative, very original. The show is part of an initiative to showcase Aboriginal art to the world through fashion. Bringing, uh, bringing Australia to the world, it's just a great concept because that's what you want, isn't it? The rest of the world to see just how amazing the artwork is. Artwork that he chose is my Aboriginal totem, so that's passed down through my family and it's something that symbolises your culture. And yeah, I'm very proud to put that out into the wider community so other people can enjoy it. Peter's first step into the world of fashion began late last year when he teamed up with Catherine Birch and Sandra Rivez to create a resort wear line using digital prints of his art. When I met Catherine, the door opened for me to work in the fashion industry and I'm really pushing myself to, to see where I can go. The shoe is just the beginning of Peter's journey into the fashion industry. He's now collaborating with local designer Alchemy to create a printed couture gown. It's exciting to work with someone that's on the same sort of same wavelength and quite passionate about what he does as well. Art is not just a hobby for Peter Farmer, it is a family tradition. We're taught from our elders that we can teach to our younger generation so they can teach it to their younger generation. Camping is such a big part of WA culture, but for some the idea of sleeping on the floor in the freezing cold and pitching a tent isn't that luxurious. If you want something a bit more secretive and high class, follow me. The days of traditional camping could be over as glamour camping, also known as glamping, has hit Western Australia. Companies such as Glamping Co, Wild Goose Glamping and Soul Glamping are changing roughing it to a five star experience. Pitching a tent or sleeping on the floor just isn't for everyone. It's going to be a lot easier saying goodbye to your old tents and hello to your custom bell tents, which will come set up and styled. More comfortable and luxurious and the fact that you can just literally rock up, sit back and instantly relax without the hassles of packing and unpacking and they just look really pretty. Glamping is the latest in luxury outdoor accommodation with all the comforts of your own home. I think people are looking for unique experiences. I think people want to get outdoors a lot more, especially in this digital age. Glamping ranges from $180 to $250 per night. Wine tours, horseback riding, yoga, and even walks along the Cape to Cape track are just some of the things you can choose from as an added extra when booking your glamping experience. The glamping bell tents don't just have to be used for accommodation. Other purposes include private functions, weddings, picnics, and even proposals. With our five-star accommodation, you can pick a location anywhere in Western Australia. We'll set up for you, you enjoy the dream, and you leave hassle-free. subculture that began in London in the late 1950s. Fast forward to today, and the mod culture is celebrated in our very own backyard. It's a good feeling, you know, to have so many people all with the same interest. Mod clothing, you all had to have the gear on, and um, you had to have the parkers and all the Ben Sherman shirts. So it was a really good scene at the time. The In Crowd Scooter Club are just one of several mod groups in Perth, and are often spotted going on scooter rallies down Perth's very own coastline. The group consists of middle-aged British expats, who are all reliving their youth by investing in scooters and getting together for annual meetups. I think with most of us, where um, there's a gap where we had families and did other things, and now there's a lot of us of our age group that are reliving our youth, if you like, um, that we've come, come together. We used to have scooters, now we've got scooters again, so we're, we, yeah, we're re reliving the youth, reborn mods. Yeah. John Guyver emigrated to Perth in 1968 and has been a mod since his teenage days when it was at its peak during the 1960s. Despite moving the other side of the world, John's love of scooters has always remained. I bought mine in 1964, my first scooter, a Lambretta. So I've always had Lambretta, this is my third one. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's just brilliant to be back on a scooter again. When I'm riding it, I feel like I'm 16 again. From the housing estates of Great Britain to the suburbs of Western Australia, the mod scene still lives on through groups like the In Crowd Scooter Club. But the question will always remain, do you choose Vespa 
or Lambretto? You were one of two. You were either a Lambretta person or a Vespa person. And I think it's still the same. I've pushed a Lambretta more than a Vespa. <laughs> <laughs> Perth is the only observatory in the southern hemisphere between Sydney and South Africa. It's too big a gap in longitude, too many hours of time zone to cover without a telescope in Perth. Because of Western Australia's unique geographical location, the Perth Observatory has been involved in some of the greatest astronomical discoveries of all time. In the 70s, we were able to be part of the International Planetary Patrol Program, where we were looking at Venus, Mars, and Jupiter and Saturn. That led on to co-discovering the rings of Uranus. A lot of work with Comet Halley. Uh, the astrographic telescope took about 10% of all the uh, glass plates that uh, the European Space Agency used to actually get their spacecraft Giotto to Comet Halley. Perth's very own Dr Andrew Williams not only built Perth's first digital camera, but also discovered one of the smallest Earth-like planets. We caught some data points that proved the existence of a planet. So we ran that program from 96 through to 2012, and we found about a dozen planets uh, between us in the group. This one was the most exciting. We're working in collaboration with a whole bunch of people around the world. So when Perth Observatory was looking at this object, it was nighttime in Perth. And then as it became daytime in Perth, they took over in Chile. When it became daytime in Chile, they took over in South Africa and so on around the world 24 hours a day. The observatory runs school tours and night tours where you can see not only the stars, but a range of telescopes and other rare and interesting parts of Perth's astronomical history. We have uh, meteorites, we have plans for the Fremantle Time Ball. We've even got the Astus Celestis, which is, there's only about 10 of them left in the world. Uh, and there was the very first star atlas that was created by uh, John Flamsteed. Perth Observatory is located in Bickley Valley, which is the perfect location for it to avoid much of Perth's light pollution. The isolation of this area enhances the experience and allows the sky to come alive. From city laneways filled with urban art to gallery cafes in the heart of Fremantle, cafe culture is about more than just good coffee. Whether you're needing a caffeine hit before a 9 to 5 or simply catching up with friends, Perth people are always on the lookout for the next best coffee stop. Staff members from some of Perth's most distinctive cafes have noticed an increase in the importance of art and atmosphere. It seems like the cafe culture is really developing in terms of the art and the style of cafes. Um, you know, here in Fez we have a really bright and vibrant colourful scheme and I find that lots of people take pictures of the chairs and sort of the art on the walls and I think that people really enjoy that as part of their cafe experience. Crooked Spire is a communal space, it's a place for the meeting of the minds, uh, uh, somewhere where creativity and innovation abounds and, and it's really for people to connect and, and find their creative self. You know, cafes and cafe culture is more than just uh, somewhere to get a coffee these days. It's got to be damn good coffee. But, you know, cafes bring vibrancy. They bring life. Uh, art's very important in that because, uh, you know, art's a reflection of what's happening in society. While quirky decor attracts most customers, others come to master the art of Instagram. Most people actually see it on Instagram and they know, like, where that zebra painting's from. And the next thing is, can I have a picture? Can I take a picture? I said, please, you can take any angle you like. And I can take your picture also with the cafe. A lot of people get coffee and then take the pictures of the art. And that's always good, having people coming around, having gained the art, you know. Some cafes are set apart from others by providing art forms that are not only visually appealing, but interactive. This is, for me, is a genuine art. You know, people write and they remember Oh, I've been to that cafe. I wrote something there. Have a look. It's a sentimental value. Here in the laneway behind Crooked Spire Art and Coffee House, we have what owner Mike Matic calls a legal wall. It's a place where uh, graffiti artists and urban artists can come and paint and uh, practice their work and have an opportunity without having to run from the police. Good coffee and good art, what more do you want out of it?
It's no secret that Perth has a thriving street art scene, but I'm going to take you to each corner of Perth to show you that it's not just the city centre that's had a vibrant makeover. Quirky characters hide in the back streets of Claremont, begging to be discovered. Form's public project has had a big part to play in the murals painted around the shopping precinct, and their appearance has been well received by locals and visitors. You wouldn't believe it, but we, when we originally started working um, on the public program, we thought it would be the younger generation that would come out and really support what we were doing. And while they certainly did, particularly on social media, the older generation came out just as much. So we've had people from all walks of life, all ages um, and different cultures come out and really enjoy the project. Vaughan believes that art is integral to community wellbeing. One of the key aims of the public initiative was to bring people out into communal spaces to enjoy and experience different types of art. While you catch some waves, you'll find colourful artworks along the gorgeous north coastline of Perth, with murals by David Ledger at Sorrento Beach and a mock island at Marmion Marine Park. Further south in Baldivis, art has begun to pop up around the shopping centre and surrounds including works by internationally acclaimed Perth artist Stormy Mills. Up in Kalamunda, I'm meeting with an artist who loves brightening up the back streets of Perth. The reason why I love street art, it's a quick way of changing a place quite dramatically. It can add colour, it can add interest in something that was maybe underutilised or wasn't particularly interesting in the past. Melsky creates some of her murals with a style that encourages the whole community to get involved. I do a lot of paint by numbers murals. A lot of my community art is doing the outlines onto a wall and then having a day or an event where everyone can come down and be a part of filling in that colour. It's a great way of getting people involved in creating a mural that will stay in their area for years to come. Go and check out some of these unlikely public galleries. You never know what might be around the next corner. So, as you can see, Perth has some fabulous hidden gems. So why not get out there and discover your own secret Perth?